Well, hello, congregation, family and friends and Bereans. Uh, I pray that all was well with you and thank you for joining me today. Let me get this centered here. There we are. Um, I, I've titled this, and this may be a series, Taking Scriptures Out of Context. And this is episode number one. I might make this a regular series. There's something that's been weighing on me for a long time. And I, I have done some videos in the past, maybe some Monday Night Manners that addressed some of these things. But there's something that really troubles me, and it should trouble you too if you're a student of scripture and you want to understand biblical truth. And that is when you see or hear preachers or Bible teachers take scriptures out of context. You hear me all the time on these videos. I've been saying this for years. One of the most egregious things that we could ever do is take scriptures or a passage out of context from how God wrote it, because the minute we do that, the minute we take something out of context, we can get that verse or that passage to say anything we want it to say. And we can start twisting and manipulating scriptures so that all of a sudden you don't have gospel truth anymore. You simply have a faulty interpretation, which can be used very often for nefarious means and for selfish motives. I'm going to give you an example, but I want to give you some background first before I show you this first example that I want to share with you in this video right here. Back in Bible times, the way people wrote was very different than the way we write now, not only just with old style English and even other languages. But if you go to any of the epistles, any of the letters, and you start seeing how they were written, you will see that the person who's writing it says up front who they are and not at the end. When you and I write a letter, at least when I grew up writing a letter, you would write, dear so-and-so, and you would address it as to whoever you're writing. And then at the end, you would sign your name, yours sincerely, Thomas. But in Bible times, a way these, and I'm going to show you all these examples, and you'll see that what I'm saying is correct. Um, when you go through all of these, the person who's writing it says it up front so that if you're reading this letter, you're receiving this scroll, you know immediately who it's from. I just opened one up here random. Here is the book of Romans. Listen to how it starts. It says, Paul, a bond servant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he has promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son. When you go all the way down to verse 7, it says who it's to. To all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, I'm just going to flip over here random and just go to 2 Corinthians. Here's how Paul starts that. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints who are throughout Achaia. Okay? Let's just try another one. I want you to see that there's a pattern with these. Here is Galatians. Paul, an apostle, not sent from men, nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren or who are with me, to the churches in Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. Why am I pointing out all this? Here's one more, the second letter to the Thessalonians. This is four examples. Paul and Silvanus and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father. Why am I pointing out these all these examples to you? Because there's a pattern. And because we understand there is a biblical pattern, we have to understand and look at these in the way that they were written. Well, there is one of these letters that has been taken out of context, and that's what I want to show you today. So if you keep going in your Bible, if you have them with you, if you're taking notes, you can go all the way back to the book of Revelation, and then we're going to go two, back, two books further back from Revelation. So Revelation, we know, is the final book of Scripture. Right before that, we have the letter of Jude. But right before that, we have a series of three letters. The first is the, the epistle of John. That's 1 John, known as 1 John. And then we have 2 John and 3 John. The second and third John are known as letters as opposed to epistles. They're letters because they're short. I want to address something in third John. This is something that, again, I heard this recently, and it makes me cringe every time I heard it. Now, remember, 
one of the biblical principles to understand scripture correctly is reading things in context. And those of you who have, who have followed me for years on social media, those of you who hear me preach, let me get rid of this, it's popping up on my screen. Those of you who hear me preach and teach the Bible know that I always preach and teach in context, verse by verse by verse. It's called exposition. It's called preaching expositorily. If you do that, it's difficult, it's not difficult to get off track if you're just picking and choosing. And here's the problem. When you take a verse and you isolate it, you can get it to say whatever you want it to say because you can apply any kind of interpretation to it. That is the problem. So if you are with me, if you're taking notes, I'm going to read you the first four verses of the third letter of John. Okay, here's what it says. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Beloved, I pray that in all respects, you may prosper and be in good health, just as your soul prospers. For I was very glad when brethren came and testified to your truth, that is, how you are walking in truth. I have no greater joy than this, than to hear of my children walking in the truth. Verse 5, beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren, and especially when they are strangers. And he goes on, and he finishes at verse 15 by saying, peace be with you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. This is a letter. Modern, modern terminology, it's like sending a text to someone. It's sending an email to someone. You are addressing them. And John has a couple of things to say in this letter. Now, did you hear anything in those verses I read that would jump out at you and make you think that it's something other than what I wrote, what John wrote, I should say? Let's go back and look at this for a moment. In verse 1, he says, the elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. John was an old man at this time. So he was known as John the elder. It's one of the names for him. So that's not hard to understand. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whoever Gaius was, we don't know anything about him. Just that John was writing a letter to this man, Gaius, whom I love in the truth, the gospel truth. In verse two, this is where certain teachers, certain Bible teachers and certain preachers pull this second verse out and make it say something that it doesn't say. I'm going to read just verse two again. And I'm going to tell you where the egregiousness comes from. Verse two, beloved, I pray that in all respects or in all areas, you may prosper and be in good health just as your soul prospers. Take that verse alone. What is it telling you? If you don't look at it in the rest of the context where he's talking about, you know, I have no greater joy. I hear that you're walking in truth. You're being obedient to the Lord Jesus. You have the gospel in you. And I'm thrilled to hear that. No, no, no. All that gets thrown out. All you do is isolate this one verse. Beloved, I pray that in all aspects or in all respects that you prosper and be in good health. And that is where the egregiousness comes from. When you take this verse alone, take it out of the letter. You can get it to say what the prosperity teachers and the prosperity Bible teachers and preachers try to get you to believe. And that is, uh, it's also known, the gospel is known as the name it and claim it gospel. It's known as the prosperity gospel. And basically, the, the tenets of that is that God wants you totally healthy and he wants you wealthy. So you're supposed to be in perfect health have a lot of money, have all the material needs. And if you don't, if you don't have good health and you don't have a lot of money, it's because you don't have enough faith. Have you ever heard that teaching? Many years ago, I got caught up with a couple of these prosperity teachers that take verses like this out of context and try to get you to believe that God wants everyone healthy and wants everyone wealthy. It's called the health and wealth gospel or the prosperity gospel or the name it and claim it gospel. They're still around. I am not going to name the people because it's pretty obvious once you study scripture and once you start hearing the popular preachers out there, you can pretty much tell almost right away, the more you understand scripture, the more you understand how these things get manipulated, you can, you can see pretty quickly who's not telling the truth for whatever reason. Maybe 
They just don't understand scripture. And that's possible, could be an honest mistake. There are others that know better. They know better, but they don't want you to know that they know these things. And so they take a verse like this and suddenly, let me, let me just say this, because this kind, of, this kind of thing really troubles me. I had to move that off my screen. I don't know if you see it. This kind of thing really troubles me because you're like hoodwinking people. You're manipulating people. Okay. I know people now who are sick, very sick. I know people right now who are struggling financially. And I would not dare ever go to any of them and say, you're sick because you don't have enough faith. You're poor because you don't have enough faith. If you had enough faith, you wouldn't be sick. You could, just, you could just speak that illness away. You could speak good health into yourself. You, you could speak all this money into your health. You want a million dollars, just speak it into existence and you know, God will give it to you. That's not the God we serve. That is not the God of the Bible. We live in a world, and let's be honest, we live in a world of sickness and death and illness and poor people. And we have challenges. We have wars going on. We live in a fallen world. And anybody who tries to tell you that simply based on a random verse like this, that God wants you perfectly healthy and wealthy and have all the material blessings in life is hoodwinking you. They're not telling you the truth. I've been saying to you for years, and these, these I, I tell you, Bereans, we all know about the Bereans. They search the scriptures daily, Acts 17, 11. They search the scriptures daily to make sure that what they were hearing, even from the Apostle Paul, whether they were hearing was the truth. That's what I encourage you to do. Every single sermon you hear, every Bible teaching you hear, including mine, including mine, you are to go and check the scriptures and make sure what you're hearing is the truth. You owe that to yourself. Otherwise, you can get caught up in this kind of nefarious teaching and this kind of deception here. God never promised every single person perfect health. God never promised every single person you would have all the money you could ever want. What does Jesus say? He says the opposite things. He says, do not build up treasures on earth where rust and moth, they corrupt everything. Build up treasures in heaven. Colossians tells us, set your mind on the things above. That doesn't mean that God can't bless us. I've known people that have been very well off financially. And I know people that have hardly ever been sick in their life, but they wouldn't dare claim something like this where well, you have to be in perfect health and have lots of money and have lots of material things simply because this verse is taken out of context. Do you understand that this here and all the other examples I gave you is what's known as a greeting. It's called a salutation. And what John was doing was no different than if you go and look at Peter's letters or James or more of Paul's letters. They all basically say the same thing because that was the style of writing back then. So how could we ever take a verse there in 3 John and simply isolate and say, well, that's what it means. I'm going to give you another example. The second letter of Paul to Timothy. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of life of Christ Jesus. To who? To Timothy, my beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That is a greeting, is a salutation. And that is the only thing that the elder, the Apostle John, is doing over here in 3 John. He's simply saying, the elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Beloved. What he's saying is, Gaius, I hope that things are going well for you. I hope that you're feeling okay. I pray that in all respects, you may prosper and be in good health. I hope that you are in good health, just as your soul prospers, because Gaius was walking in the truth spiritually. John is wishing him, I, I hope that the rest of your life is going well. But that is not a promise. That is not a promise that we can claim and suddenly say, oh, because this isolated incident this little verse over here says you should prosper, then you have to prosper. No, we don't know anything about Gaius. Suppose he wasn't doing good. We don't know that. Be very, very careful when you are listening to sermons and Bible studies. I've had people really get mad at me over the years just for these kind of videos because I dare to speak out. 
I'm not the only one speaking out about this stuff. And there are so many examples in scripture. That I'm saying I may just wind up having to do a series of these because it's really bothering me uh, that, that this, this is out there. I don't pretend to be a Bible scholar. I'm not. I don't pretend to be an expert in the Bible. I am not. I can only tell you that I've been studying it for 40 years. I know something of scripture, but I also think that I know the Bible well enough to know when I'm being snowed, when I'm being hoodwinked. And I also have trained myself to be a Berean where I will go and search it out and make sure that what I'm hearing is the truth. And I encourage you friends to do the same thing. So if, if this video is troubling you, maybe, maybe the Holy Spirit is trying to tell you something. Uh, if it's something where you never want to come back and watch another one of my videos, so be it. I'm making no apologies. But this, this verse was on my heart earlier today. And I just wanted to come on here and to share something with you because this is egregious. This is wrong when things like this happen and scriptures are taken out of context. Be very careful. Read the Bible in context. Study it in context. There's a reason why God wrote the Bible the way he did. And we have to study it the way that God wrote it. If we stop pulling out a verse here, a verse there, a verse here, suddenly you have a different philosophy. You have a different religion. You have a different set of truths. And then you have a different set of tenets under the guise of Christianity. It's happening all the time and it continues to happen. Be very careful. So my, my advice to you is be a diligent brain in Acts 1711. Study the scriptures. I pray that this video has been of some help. I hope that it's maybe opened your eyes. But more than anything, I pray that this has spurred you on uh, to study the scripture for yourself and make sure to the very best of your ability, test everything. The Bible tells us to test the spirits. We are to test everything. This book, the Bible, will hold up to any kind of scrutiny. Bible teachers can be wrong. Preachers and pastors can be wrong, sometimes just out of ignorance, lack of study. But sometimes Satan can use preachers and pastors for the worst means, and that is to manipulate people. I don't want to see you be manipulated. So do your due diligence, my friends. Study scripture. Well, I thank you for joining me. My video probably went on longer than my intention was, but I hope that I made the point. And I want to thank you for being with me. Feel, feel free to share this video or any video, anything that helps you. This is for God's glory. It's for the edification of the body of Christ. So I want to thank you for joining me. And I am going to sign off now. See you soon. God bless you.